Welcome to the Grok Shop and part one in my golf cart brake job series. In this video, I'll show how I service the brake shoes of my 1993 club car. The brakes had become quite noisy and stopping on steep descents was getting kind of dicey. Be sure you check out the pertinent service manual pages for your golf cart before starting this project. On one quick note in the service manual, they usually call for loosening the equalizer jam nut. I don't usually find that's necessary, but this is it if you do. Okay, first we'll start off by applying the parking brake. Next, we'll chalk the wheels. Since I'm also adjusting the pedal free play and the pedal stop bumper, I'm jacking the entire golf cart up. I'll cover these topics separately in other videos, but if you're just working on brake shoes, you don't necessarily need to do a full jack. Okay, next we'll go ahead and loosen those rear lug nuts. Okay, next we'll go ahead and jack up that rear end. Whenever you're jacking, of course, you wanna rest it back down on jack stands. Okay, next we can remove the rear wheel and release the parking brake. Now the brake drum should slide right off. If they don't, you may need to release some preload off the manual adjuster behind the brake drum. I'll be showing how to do that here in a minute. Okay, just for those who aren't aware, brake shoes may contain asbestos. Asbestos is very dangerous. Most newer brake shoes should be asbestos free, but if yours aren't or you're not sure, you need to protect yourself. The best way to do that is with a properly rated respirator. Here in the US, that would be a P100 rated respirator. An example of that would be like the 3M1 here, which has a 2097 filter set on it. You can see it's stamped P100. I'll link this in the description below. If you think your brakes may contain asbestos, avoid using compressed air to clean them. Okay, next we'll use some calipers to measure the lining thickness at each edge of the lining. There's four edges in total. Okay, these are the results of my measurements, and you can see the thinnest edge is about a tenth of an inch or 2.45 millimeters. So how thin should the lining on the shoe be allowed to get before you replace it, right? It seems like most people leave it up to the shoe manufacturer to be the determining factor, and it somewhat depends on if you have bonded or riveted shoes. With bonded shoes, you can actually go a little bit thinner than riveted ones because the rivets will actually start to show through first. But the best information I could come up with was that for golf carts with bonded shoes, anywhere between one to one and a half millimeters is about the minimum. And, and that's really the minimum for any vehicle that I've ever seen. Usually with cars, it's two to three millimeters. Although I wasn't quite at the limit, it was starting to get kind of close. There's a lot of steep hills where I live and I have precious cargo in my cart sometimes. So I decided to pick up some new shoes. I found these aftermarket asbestos free brake shoes. I'll show how they compare dimensionally to the OEM shoes I had, but the price is good and the reviews have been decent. My only reservation was longevity issues, but I decided to take a chance. I'll post up if these start showing premature wear. Keep in mind, there's different brake shoes for different generations of club car and easy go, so make sure you get the right one for your golf cart. For those who are interested, I'll link these shoes in the description below. Also in the description below, I'll link my Amazon storefront, which contains links to these shoes, the respirator, lots of the tools you'll see me using in this video and other videos are all available at the amazon.com grok shop storefront. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. This is a nice diagram I found on easygogolfcartguide.com. I thought this was a pretty good explanation of the brake shoe wear pattern that you'll see in golf carts normally. So pretty much you can expect edge A to wear before the other edges. Okay, next we wanna remove the shoe retainer, so we'll just spin the shoe retainer pin so the pin flange lines up with the hole and the shoe retainer springs. Okay, next we need to remove the rubber dust cover boot off the adjuster off the back of the drum bagging. To make the adjustments, you can use a seven millimeter open end wrench. If you don't have that, a crescent wrench will work fine. So what we wanna do right now is remove all the preload from the brake shoes. Remove the preload by turning the adjuster in the clockwise direction until it stops turning. 
All right, if your adjuster is not turning very easily, you can hit it with some lube. Uh, this is a good time to do it because you'll have an opportunity to clean up any excess, but you wanna to try to contain the lube just in the adjuster port there. Okay, next we wanna unseat one of the two shoes at one end. Uh, I usually just unseat it at the top where the adjuster is. Usually once you get one shoe unseated, the other shoe will come loose. Then you'll have enough slack so that you can unhook one of the springs. I usually unhook the top one and then the whole assembly should just come out. One quick note, if you plan to recycle your shoes and your trailing and leading shoes are the same like mine are, I would recommend marking which one's trailing and which one's leading anyway, and then reinstall them in the same location. The reason I say that is as you can see, the inside and outside of the shoe lining can have different wear thicknesses. Consequently, if you swap them, the contact area of the brake shoe and brake drum could go down and your brake performance could suffer. Okay, it's time for some cleanup. I just threw all my parts into a bucket, got my favorite brake cleaner out, and just went to town there. As you can see, my brake housing is pretty caked up. I went ahead and hit it with a brake cleaner one time, then I'll move on to using a wire brush and a screwdriver for scraping, and then more brake cleaner, and just keep at it till it's cleaned up. Okay, next we're gonna go ahead and lube up the actuator slash slider. And this is really important to the functionality of the brakes. You can see even though mine are clean, they're not moving very well yet. I'm gonna lubricate the friction plates up with grease, but before I do that, I'm gonna use TriFlow, which is something that uh, I use in the motorcycle realm a lot. And I find it's better than WD-40, but if you only have WD-40, it's a good start. You need something to penetrate deep down where you can't get the grease. So I like to hit it with that first and sort of wipe it down, and then I'll come back with my grease. Once you've got it doused real well with your penetrant, you just wanna work it back and forth a good bit till it starts moving nice and easy. Definitely make sure you clean up any excess lube. You don't want any of that stuff contaminating your brake shoes. If you look at the club car service manual, they call for a dry graphite grease for the friction points. Obviously that's a good grease to use. However, in this case, I'm gonna use a Molly grease. The reason I'm using Molly grease is because I had some left over from a Honda brake job I did. I figure if it's good enough for my Honda automobile, it's good enough for my golf cart. But I think the takeaway is pretty much any high temperature grease will work. The dry graphite, the Molly, probably some kinds of silicone grease are fine too. Next, we wanna remove that glaze from the contact area inside the drum. I've got a sanding pad, which is a 80 grit uh, 3M pad. I think it is, you could use 80 grit or 120 grit, maybe uh, sandpaper. You don't really have to sand it a lot. You just wanna scuff it up, get that glaze off. After sanding, we'll go ahead and use our brake cleaner and get that drum all cleaned up. Okay, if you're recycling your old shoes, make sure to scuff these up as well. Okay, now we'll go ahead and apply some grease to the five contact points for each brake shoe. There's a contact point in the adjuster, there's three points on the drum backing, and then there's one contact point on the actuator. And all we really want is a very thin coating of grease. We definitely don't want any cakeage. Previously, I mentioned about how these shoes have a top and a bottom. If you look at the ends, there's what they call the narrow 
in, which is the ones on the left, the two on the left there. And then there's what they call a tapered in, which is the two on the right. The narrow in needs to go into the adjuster at the top and the taper ends go into the actuator at the bottom. So it's totally possible to put your brakes in upside down or some sort of mixed bag and they'll still actually work. However, they might not work quite as well, so I wouldn't recommend it. So there's probably a lot of different ways to install the shoes. For me, I like to just run the top spring first and then sort of hang the assembly over the top and then hook a spring up to one side. Uh, and note that uh, you might have a bigger spring and a smaller spring. If you do, usually the bigger spring should go on top and the smaller spring would go on bottom. Also, you can run your springs behind or in front of the brake shoes. It really doesn't matter. Either way is fine. In case you get confused, you can always refer to your other wheels brakes as sort of a guide to guide you in. Okay, next we need to get the lower spring attached to both shoes. They sell quite a few gizmos to do this, but you don't really need any of that. With the lower spring attached to one shoe, just tuck in the body of the spring up behind the actuator. Okay, here note that both shoes are seated in the adjuster at the top, but only the shoe on screen right is seated in the actuator. So that gives us a little slack having that left shoe not seated yet. So having this slack allows us to hook that bottom spring into both shoes. Okay, next we wanna get that left brake shoe seated in the actuator at the bottom. Uh, what I do is I use a, like a pair of pliers to hold the bottom of the shoe and then a big lever like this big screwdriver against the wheel hub and just kind of work it, crank it pretty hard and uh, hold your tongue the right way. And uh, with a little luck, it'll go right on there. Now with both shoes seated, we can insert the brake retainer pin through the little hole in the brake drum backing. Next, we can insert the brake retainer spring around the brake retainer pin. Sometimes it can be helpful to utilize that hole in the hub to get your finger in there and line up the spring and the pin. Now just clamp the pin with your needle nose and compress the spring with the screwdriver and twist it and lock it. So now it'll be pretty much rinse and repeat for the other side. If you're having trouble getting your needle nose onto the pin because you can't get it past the hub, you can actually slide each shoe back and forth about a quarter of an inch. And that usually gives you just enough room to get the needle nose down to clamp onto the end of that pin. Now I'll just make a quick check that the shoes are centered around the drum. Next, we can reinstall the brake drum. When you first put the brake drum back on, it should turn freely. Okay, next we wanna start tightening up the brakes by moving the adjuster in that counterclockwise direction several ticks. And I usually go until I can just start to feel the brakes scraping. Once I feel a little bit of scraping, I'm gonna go mash on the brakes a few times. When you go to mash on the brakes, that kinda of has the effect of centering the shoes within the drum. After that, we'll tighten it up some more and I basically keep on tightening until it becomes very difficult to turn by hand and then I'll back it off maybe two or three ticks and then mash on the brakes a couple more times. Once you've got just a very light amount of drag, you've pretty much got it dialed in. It might not drag evenly all the way around, but with golf cart brakes, this is considered normal. Okay, next we can put our adjuster cap back on. Okay, so that completes one side of the cart. Now you can go ahead and do the other side of the cart. And when you're done there, it's time to go ahead and get the wheels back on. Next, we can go ahead and lower the cart. Okay, next we can go ahead and torque the lug nuts. 55 to 60 pounds is usually what I use. Uh, you wanna go into a star pattern, which, yeah, there's only four bolts. So it's one and then the one across from it and then the one next to it and then the one across from that. Okay, next you wanna take a test drive on a flat surface or as flat as possible to test everything out. Depending on how picky you are, if you want both wheels locking up at exactly the same time, you may have to lift it up again and dial it in, make one side a little tighter, one side a little looser by turning that adjuster as needed. Also, do be aware it takes a little time for the brake shoes to bed into the brake drums. So what you'll see is braking performance will improve over some days or weeks depending on how often you ride. So that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Be sure to stay tuned for more golf cart related videos. That's how it's done.
Thanks for watching.